Amen. Well, let's go ahead. Let's get into the lesson. Um, are you going to help uh, with the reading today, um, Sister uh, Regina? Yes, I can. Definitely. Okay. Great, great, great. So let's pray. Let's get into it. We got a lot to cover. I'm not going to try to cover it all, but I do want you guys to know and and, and understand and learn uh, the revelation of what God speaks about when he wants us to be united in one. And so if there is, it's, it's huge. It's more than what most people think. It's not a subject that people study. Uh, it's not something that people look forward to. Um, because it, it, of course, but it is the heart of God. Amen. So let's pray. Father, in the blessed name of Jesus, um, once again, we come to your throne of grace. And Lord, I just ask that you be with us. And most of all, Lord, according to your, your prayer, Father, I pray that we will become one as you are one. Father, I pray that you would put this prayer and this desire in each and every one of us, that even tonight we would see the relevance of what you are saying, uh, what you're doing what you would desire to do, what you want to do in us, that we will be one in you and one in each other. And so, Father, we just I just pray for clarity. I pray for those that have worked all day, mentally tired, physically tired, emotionally tired. Father, I pray that you would quicken them by the power of your Holy Spirit, that they would receive, thus says the Lord, and, um, and that you would continue, Lord God, your work inside of us, that we would be conformed into your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone say amen. Amen. Okay. So same scripture, very important. And for those of you that are just joining us, um, just a little background, Book of Acts. We started a while back, but it's just so important. There's some places in the book of Acts that's so important that are skipped over, that are rushed over. Um, but sometimes we don't understand the weight that they carry so that we can understand the rest of the book of Acts. Um, some say the book of Acts is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. I heard others say it's the Acts of the Apostles. Um, it's true that both have a, a, a vital uh, part in the book of Acts. And I also understand that the book of Acts has not stopped. There's no end. Why? Because we're still in the dispensation of the church. But one thing you need to understand, the book of Acts is about the dispensation, the time of the church. Ever since Jesus left and ascended unto heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, he sent back the Holy Spirit and that we are to be the light and the salt of the earth until Jesus comes. And this is the history behind the church. If you ever want to know what a church is supposed to be about and what they're supposed to um, represent, you need to read the book of Acts. Amen. Amen. We have diluted the book of Acts just in the 21st century uh, simply because um, uh, we're more sophisticated, more educated, and we don't depend on the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God uh, as they had no choice. There was nothing to be sophisticated about in those days. Come on, they had to have faith. Come on, and God had to move or it wasn't going to get done. Uh, but we're just a little different now. And I believe that's what's taking place in the world today. Um, I was talking to someone today and and uh, I've been saying this for years. God has moved his hand and um, his, the grace, come on, of God is over. Uh, there now, I don't know if you heard on the news, but there's now a seaweed uh, that is now coming up on shores of beautiful beaches around the world and it's poisoning the fish. It's destroying the um, uh, all of the beautiful plants and things of that in, in the ocean. So the ocean is, it's interesting. The ocean has a plague in it. The ocean is now sick. And so it's just, I said, wow, God is not playing. Um, the floods, the rains, there's just terrible things taking place in the world today. And simply because, and then, and, but here's the interesting thing. The church is the agent of God in the earth. And so in other words, we still have a part, even though the world's falling apart, we still have a part to play. And so it's really important that we understand and that we know um, the book of Acts and what it's all about. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start reading here at Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, 
the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Hosea said, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Amen. Amen. So a little background. Once again, John Peter arrested. A lame man was healed. Um, a miracle had been done. This man was over 40 years old, never walked in his life. He's leaping for joy. John and Peter are on their way to the temple. And um, Peter simply says, look, silver and gold I have not, but in the name of Jesus, uh, such as I have, get up and walk. And the man gets up, he starts walking. The miracle takes place. The place goes crazy. The, the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders of the day, don't like it because they don't want anyone preaching about Jesus, even though Jesus is now dead. Um, and of course, according to them, he's gone. But of course, we know that he rose from the dead and he ascended to the Father and sits at the right hand of the Father. So anyway, the Holy Spirit was poured out. The day of Pentecost came, the church was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Peter and John and the rest of the church were praying. And uh, so anyway, they release uh, John and Peter. They come back and they tell everything that took place because the leaders couldn't hold them because they were afraid of the, the multitude that had accepted this miracle. And people were happy that this lame man was walking. So they let them go and they charge them not to preach in Jesus' name. And when they get back, this is what takes place. They start to pray. It isn't it interesting that it takes a something uh, like a disaster or something terrible to happen for people to come together? Well, they came together in this um, that John and Peter weren't supposed to preach. They came back with the testimony and the people were just, you know, wow, miracles taking place. And they had one heart, one soul. And I love this. And the thing that took place was a revelation. Can you imagine? So these people that had need were in the church. And come on, those needs weren't being taken care of. But it took this to take place for them to do what and say, wait a minute. My brother and sister is in me. Okay, let me go ahead and, 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 and help them with what I have. It took something like this for people to come on. You have to understand this was happening before John and Peter went, were arrested. These people still had needs, right? There still were people that didn't have food and things of that nature. And it took something like this, a miracle to take place for them to do what? To come to this place of unity. And so I have note. And uh, excuse me, I have, I'm on, you're going to read a lot of notes today. I got a lot of notes that I put in there. Uh, I should have just, uh, uh, used another system. But anyway, so you guys forgive me for that, but you're going to hear a lot. No, quite a bit today. But the unity of the kingdom of God that Jesus prayed for literally came to pass. And that's what I'm talking about. This unity of having one heart, and one soul. Come on. And they had all things in common. It came to pass. Jesus prayed about this while he was still here on earth. We find it in the book of John chapter 17. You guys remember it, I'm sure. You guys have been around for a while. And um, and this multitude of those who believe, again, one heart, one soul, and they came together. And the Bible says, come on, they declare, come on, they had all things in common. So people who had at one time had nothing in common came to God and now have everything in common. And here's the prayer that Jesus prayed. And I'll go ahead and read this. It says, and I am not praying for those alone, but also for the future believers who will come to me because of the testimony of these, talking about the disciples. And so he's talking about the, the New Testament. He's talking about the letters that are going to be written. He's talking about the, the apostles and the preachers and the sermons that they're going to preach. He says, I, I'm praying not just for my disciples, but I'm praying for those that are going to believe what the disciples have testifying about, what they're going to preach about, how they're going to talk about Jesus. Verse 21, and he goes on and he says, my prayer for all of them is that they will be one heart in mind, just as you and I, our Father, not just as you, excuse me, not just as you are in me 
and I am in you, so they will be one in us. And the world will believe you sent me. Come on. The world will believe. So in other words, here's Jesus praying this prayer for you and me, even though we weren't here. 2,000 years ago, Jesus had us in mind. And what did he have us in mind? That we would be united in one mind, one heart, and in what? In Christ. Verse 22. And he goes on, he says, and I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. The glory, the glory that you gave me. That's powerful. I love it. Because he declares this thing that's what's going to bring them together. There's this glory that Jesus received, that Jesus gave to the apostles, and that when we believe, we receive the glory that God gave to Jesus and also the apostles. And I have here the glory of God also refers to the visible presence of God among his people. And so in other words, there's a there's all kinds of glories, and that's a whole nother subject. But this glory that he was talking about was manifestational. It was it was visible. It was it would, would it would manifest itself through his people. And so he goes on and says, and here's this glory, which is his love and his righteousness, manifest through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's the glory that Jesus was talking about. So now I want you to read uh 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror of the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I in them and you in me, all being perfected into one so that the world will know you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. I love that. This explains the glory that he's talking about. He says, come on, being transformed, come on, the, the love of God, being transformed into the righteousness of God from glory to glory. In other words, he's talking about you growing. He says, and, and how does it happen? It happens, what? By the spirit of God. So in other words, we really can't become one or when we become one, Come on, we, there's the manifestation of God's love and God's righteousness in us as we grow from, from love to love, from righteousness to righteousness, from holiness to holiness. Come on, when we start what growing in peace, growing in joy, there's this manifest, manifestation of God's glory. People see it in us. And we're supposed to glow, grow in God's glory. Come on, because we become like his glory. Come on, that's what Jesus was praying about. And we become united in that glory. We become united in the love of God, united in the righteousness, You're united in his peace, united in his purpose, united in the mission. Come on, united. Come on, Jesus so, so loved the world, he sent us on a big God son. We are supposed to love the world that we do what? that we would pick up our cross and ourselves and follow Jesus, that souls would be saved, that people would know who Jesus is. Come on, we're united. This, this uniting, this thing that Jesus is talking about, us becoming one, is, is man, it's so skipped over. And what people don't realize, this is really the heart of God. This was Jesus' heart poured out to the Father about us, that we would become like him and that we would be united. Come on, and this this godliness of his glory you know this is not talked about this is this is powerful and it's something that's so over missed because of so so much of our lives are spent on and I, you know we live in some hard times no doubt but so much of our life is just spent on surviving trying to make it trying to get to this from point a to point b and um but jesus had something else in mind that I believe the church has neglected over the years. We've just neglected this. I want to I want to share this with you. And this uh, just came to me, and I just love it when the Lord just gives me revelation and He kind of completes a picture. This is just a complete picture of a, of a person. Number one, Jesus saves you, and He delivers you from the penalty of sin. Number one. So when you get saved, you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Come on, Jesus saves your soul. Your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life. He seals you with to the day of redemption. Come on. And when you die, you go to heaven. Jesus also heals you. So Jesus doesn't just save you. Come on. One scripture talks about um, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has 
He has called me to heal the brokenhearted. Um, Jesus comes to heal us and make us whole. So we don't just get saved. Jesus heals us. There's this process. Everybody's testimony is different, but there's this process of healing that takes place. And some of us, I'm going to tell you something, until you deliver your healing can't take place. Some of, some of us are saved, but come on, we're not trying to what, be delivered. So we can't get healed. So there's there's a process that takes place from glory to glory to glory to salvation, to deliverance, to healing. And then there's, there's this process of what I like to call the transformation. So number three, Jesus transforms us into what? The very image of God. How does he do it? He sanctifies us. He sanctifies us what? With the word of God. We are constantly under the process of sanctification. That's what he means from glory to glory. We are being sanctified. We are being cleansed. We're being washed. We are being what? We're being created what? Into the very image of God and what he looks like from glory to glory. Come on, that's what the scripture says. All being made perfect into one. So we're all supposed to, at some point, look like Jesus. We're all, at some point, supposed to act like Jesus. And at some point, come on, we're supposed to grow up, come on, and love like Jesus. Number four, and Jesus uses this to show us, come on, he uses us to show himself in the earth. In other words, we're the salt and the light of the world. Sometimes some of you are the only Jesus people going to see. Come on. And so I love this. So we go from salvation, from deliverance, to healing, to transformation. Come on, don't miss this. To now where you're doing what? You're showing people about Jesus. They're seeing, come on, the glory of God in you. And you're some, you know, um, uh, some brothers and sisters always say, I don't say a word. I just live it in front of them. That's the glory of God. That's good. As long as they're seeing Jesus, come on, I hope that's what you're living. Come on, but listen to this. And then listen to this. And then number five, and we go to live with Jesus for eternity. That's the complete circle. We are saved by him, healed by him, transformed to look like him, used by him for his glory, then we are going to what? To go live with Jesus, come on, for an eternity. So when Jesus says this prayer, Father, I pray that they will what? Be like you. What he's really saying is that, come on, this is, we're supposed to go to heaven and spend eternity with God. Let me tell you something. If you don't want to be one with God now, what are you going to do when you get to heaven? I'm, I'm amazed at the people that don't get heaven, that they don't get it, that you, you know, love the world. He says, love not the world, nor the things in the world, because if the, if the love of this world is in you, the love of the Father is not. And so I'm just amazed that we don't get it. And so Jesus is praying his prayer because his heart is to, to walk, to be together. But he, it, it's, he, he to be together in such a way, come on, that there's, there's, there's love. There's love. Emulating, what's the greatest commandment of all? To love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, then your brother as yourself. And so to be like Jesus or to be one with Christ is to walk in this glory that God declared from the very beginning. Oh, there's so much about God that we need to talk about, about being one. It, it will blow you away because it's all through scripture. It's all through scripture. Jesus and God is not some God that just wants to be alone. He's a God of community. Um, <laughs> he, he's not an island. And just think about all the creations and everything that he made. It, it always, always works together. And so even in creation, we see God's oneness. And so anyway, so this happens when the believer is what? Filled with the Holy Spirit and not just filled with the Spirit or gifts and callings, but also walk in the spirit of unity. Galatians 5 and 16 says, I say then walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5, 25 and 26. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, um, provoking one another, envying one another. You know what he, I love this. He starts talking about the spirit. 
Then he starts talking about what divides us. In other words, if you're going to live in the spirit, come on, live in the unity of the spirit, walk in the spirit, come on, be of the same mind, come on, have the same heart, but don't become so mm, envious. Come on, don't provoke others. Come on. Uh, he doesn't want us to be, in other words, these things are the flesh, but what they're going to what divide us. There is a unity that takes place. When Jesus says this prayer, he's talking about us being united. Come on, not just in purpose, but united in, in the person. Let me say that again. He doesn't want us to just be united in purpose and having something to do. But God wants us to be so united in the person of God because the person of God is love and righteousness and, and joy and peace and long suffering, gentleness and kindness and self control. That's who he is. That's who, that's who God is. That's his character. That's his attributes. That's the person he is. It is about this relationship, not just the works. Come on, the works by themselves mean nothing. The works by themselves mean nothing. So then he goes on, this is number one, and we go to number one, unity among the people of God is critical for the revealing of the visible manifestation of the glory of God. I like that. Visible manifestation of the glory of God. Amen. Give me one second. Okay. So that's what unity is supposed to show. The glory of God. That's why God says, that's why the Lord said, Jesus Christ says, well, Lord, I, I pray that it be one that the world would believe, that the world will only see God's visible manifestation through our unity that we're united with him and united with each other. Uh, number two, um, they were united spiritually. I can't say this enough. Uh, so many churches got people that are not filled with the Holy Spirit, that are in positions um, that are not trying to be filled with the Holy Spirit, um, that are filled with self, ambitions, and all kinds of other things. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. Um, and so the, the manifestation can't take place. The, the Holy Spirit doesn't come into a divided house. He will stay with you as an individual. But what keeps the Holy Spirit back is when people are divided. But when people join together in this unity in Christ, then the manifestation of God's Spirit, the more unity we are the, um, in Christ, the greater the anointing of God, amen. Okay, number, number three, meaning, meaning uh, they were walking and living and abiding in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit expresses itself through the believers and seeing the need of others. And so all of this is what takes place. When we talk about this, this is what this means. This is the glory. Come on, this is the manifestation. Come on, this is the unity. This is, and this is what it looks like. Some people love to talk about what, what does that look like? Well, it, it looks like one people doing what? One thing together, come on, to help other people and, and, and recognizing that, look, what we have in common is that we are human beings created by God. Come on, to give God glory. Um, we have a short time here. And we need to show each other love because he loved us. That's what it looks like to have one heart. That's what it looks like. We And we think alike. And it's not just about me. It's about us. That's what it looks like. Amen. And when there is disunity, the Holy Spirit is quenched. And there is no activity of the unity working in the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians 5 and 19 says, do not what? Quench the Holy Spirit. What does the word quench mean? It means to extinguish, to put out. You, you know, you ever have someone just puts out, you know, there's a party going on and they just, you know, just, they're just a joy killer. <laughs> you know, you, you ever have that joy killer just come in the room, just kill the joy for no reason at all. Now, don't get me wrong. If something's going on, come on, people need to get your 
attention. I, I get, come on, stop the party, stop the record. Stop, I, I get that. But I mean, for no reason at all, they're just joy killers. Come on, quench the Holy Spirit. Come on, amen. Okay, Ephesians 4 and 3 says it like this, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It is work. We have to, it doesn't mean we're never going to face, come on, our flesh or somebody else's flesh or some, some disagreement or something we can't, come on, we don't see eye to eye on. But it means that, come on, we are purposely supposed to understand that it's not what divides us, it's what keeps us, it's what unites us. And come on, and if we have a disagreement, we should, we're supposed to work through it. And at the end of the decision, Come on, there's nothing better. No one's no one's right, no one's wrong. You know what? Let's squash it. Come on, we need to be united. That is so, so important. Endeavoring meaning to strive, attempt, undertake, to labor, to work at. Come on, to keep that unity so that glory can stay there. No, to make it plain, crucify the flesh. Amen, I should have put crucify your flesh because the truth is, is that what what always divides us and what always quenches the Holy Spirit is somebody's carnality and somebody's flesh. They get caught up in themselves. Come on, it's about them. It's about their opinion. They have to be right. They have to be seen. They have to let somebody know. Come on, they're offended. They're hurt. They're sensitive, overly sensitive, because they don't want anybody to see them in this, this light. You can't talk to me like that. There's so many things. Uh, that the flesh is what is is offended by. And that's that's the person sometimes fool themselves. They gotta tell you, they have to tell you about yourself. Okay, here we go. Sins of the brother. And we talked about this last uh, last week, but this is worth going back over again. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. And moreover, if your brother does what? Sin against you, go tell him to his faults. That's a good one. Uh, between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. And I, I know, I love this. I love this. It's something really to, to put, to renew your mind set with. Somebody does something, just put it down say, brother, you know what? You really hurt me. Let me tell you what, what, what happened. Because I, I, I honestly believe 90% of the time, people don't have ill intentions. I really believe that with all my heart. You may not, okay, whatever. We, we may not agree on that. But I just believe sometimes people do things out of hurt, out of pain, out of ignorance, out of um, um, they don't understand. That or sometimes I will say things and not realizing what I said or how I said it or oh did I say that? You know, because I got so much on my mind. I, I, I thought I said this, but my mouth said something else. And I really don't believe. Um, and but people get hurt, and it's really interesting. Sometimes you don't even know they're hurt. You don't even know they're bothered. They're, oh. oh I didn't know you, you should have said something. And sometimes people don't do it. So here's Jesus te teaching us how to keep the unity in the faith. So the objective is to gain your brother and to keep the unity of the spirit. Again, Ephesians chapter four, verse three, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace is something notable. You need to notice any time something happens, come on, uh, fellowship has been broken. Oh, that's a good one. Because you don't want fellowship. You don't want authentic, real fellowship to be broken. But what people will do is they'll just keep their distance. Oh, I ain't going to mess with you no more. You know, I, I'm not going to speak to you. I'm going to act like you're not there. I'm not going to I'm not going to be real with you. I'm not going to let my guard down. Um, but that's not the unity of the spirit. You know, the unity of the spirit is that you forgive each other. Sometimes you need to just forgive a person if they don't, they don't know anybody. You just need to forgive them, especially if you recognize it. They just don't know any better. Okay, 16 and 17. But if you will not hear, take with you one or two or more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. You guys are picked very wisely. You can't pick your friends, can't pick your sister, your brother, because you like them and you know they're going to agree with you. You have to really pray and be wise. Usually your pastor and ministers or elders of the church Usually, not all the time. Sometimes people have titles, but not maturity. Um, usually, um, you can um, 
tap into that resource that you have in the body of Christ. 17, he goes on, he says, and if they refuse to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuse to even hear the church, then let him be like a heathen and a tax collector. I, I, this is powerful. And we talked about this last week and we talked about how churches don't really practice this truth. They don't really practice this commandment of God. And, and so we suffer from it. And so, no, God places the unity of the church at such a high priority that anyone who comes against this unity must physically be put out of the church, physically removed. This is Jesus talking. This is Jesus, the head of the church, the one that came and died for the church, the one that, come on, the one who has the authority and the power, the one who the church has been birthed in, sanctified by, in Jesus' name. That's who said this. This is not, this is not, this is not someone with you to have an opinion about. This is the word of God. We talked about the authority of God's word on uh, Sunday. And we just tapped on a little bit of the authority. But this is Jesus talking. And um, in other words, he wants, come on, unity so bad that any bad apple has to go. Man. And if this was practiced in churches today, you may not have a lot. You might lose a lot of people because everybody's going to see it. It's wrong, and I thought God was love, but you don't know your, you don't know the Bible. Uh, there's a lot of thinking without knowing, <laughs> and so, but God does this. He is the one who has the wisdom. He's the one that knows, and if we pay the price, come on, then we'll reap the harvest. Verse eighteen. But surely He says, "I say to you, whatever here we go, whatever you bind on earth." What is He talking about? Binding of this, this relationship or this, this, this person that's discord inside of the church, whatever you're buying, you know, that thing has to be bound. Right? He says, I'm going to bind it in heaven. In other words, I'll stop the evil spirits from doing what? Doing what they're doing right now. He says, and whatever you loose on earth, come on, I will loose in heaven. Hallelujah. Come on, when you start, come on, acting, come on. A, uh, following the righteousness of God, according to God, I will back you up in heaven. I will bind and loosen all that's wrong, all that's not right, all that's not of the kingdom, all that's not of God. That's really what that scripture is talking about. We we bind and loosen so many things. So I laugh as sometimes I hear people praying about binding and loosening personal stuff that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God, just your unhappy feelings about what's going on in your life at the time. And so he goes on, that's what this is talking about. No, binding and loosening is for the unity of the kingdom. Come on, first and foremost. I'm not saying that God won't do other things. I'm just saying this is the, the wisdom behind the scripture. 19. I love it. Again, I say to you, <laughs> again, so if God repeats himself, again, I say to you, if two or three of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. Now, here's where most people stop and mess up. They read this scripture and they just, oh, he said anything. But verse 20, now is it down to what those any things are. But where there are two or three gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. Um, you can't be asking God, you can't be touching and agreeing on any foolishness. It's gotta be about God and the will of God. It's gotta be about, Jesus said in his name, his name covers, the, his name is the kingdom of God. His name, all that he's done, all that Jesus is about. That's what he means when he says we're two or three gathered together in my name, not in your opinion, not in your, des your, your desire, not in your ambition, in my name. And according to his kingdom, according to his will. Okay, let's go on. Note, and we go again. <laughs> when Jesus declares that if 
you gather together in his name. He's referring to everything concerning the mission and the purpose of the kingdom of God, regardless of what platform. Now that platform can be television. That platform can be anything. That platform can be family. In Jesus' name, the family. In Jesus' name, you're raising children. In Jesus' name, you're married. Come on. You can touch and agree for your family. You can have a business. As long as you are doing what? The right thing. Come on. You're tithing. Come on. And you're doing what? Hiring people and treating them right. Come on. God, God wants you to have what? Righteousness in your business. In Jesus' name. Yes, you can go to school and get an education. Oh, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, as long as you take that what? That, oh, hallelujah, that opportunity that God gives you to glorify him. Oh, hallelujah. There was a time where people that got educated were responsible. Come on. Uh, and understood the responsibility behind the education. It wasn't about them. It was them to serve the world with the knowledge they have received. Oh, hallelujah. You had a lot of Christian schools and colleges, and it was about glorifying God with the knowledge that they, they retained in the earth. But now, come on, it's all about that six-figure job now. Amen. Amen. So here we go. This glory of God, a unity does not exist in. Now, this can be Argue, you can argue this, and I can see where, you know, there are um, uh, exceptions to the rule. But, but you will understand where I'm, I'm going with this, hopefully. But it's, you don't find it in politics. You know, they, they try, but, you know, we're so divided, and it's not about God at all. It's about people. And um, some people trying to be self-righteous and other people that don't understand God at all just understand how come you want to hurt people? They don't get it. Politics. Jesus said, my kingdom is what? It's not of this world. Personal preference and style. Come on. Uh, people tickle me. You know, when we stop wearing suits and ties, they thought that was great. You know, I, me, me too. I, I, I like that. But <laughs> it had nothing to do whether God, come on, it's, it's your heart. Come on. Whether you decide to dress up or, or, or come normal or, or come in tennis shoes, or, it doesn't matter. It's your heart. And for us to judge people, come on, that's not the unity. God's not asking us to look the same. Come on, that's not the unity God is looking for. Okay, ethnicity, culture, it's no such thing as a white church and a black church. You know, but yet on every Sunday morning, that's, you know, and, 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 and honestly, that's how we describe it, because they like this kind of style of music and they like this kind of style of music. But that doesn't that's not the glory of God. And that's not, you know, whatever style of music doesn't really matter um, as long as the music glorifies God, glorifies God. Economic status, it's pride, selfish ambition. And then, of course, the F is what contention, dispute, arguments uh, about who's right or who's better. Okay, that doesn't just doesn't work. Okay, here we go. So let's try to get some of these. Um, Regina, I'm gonna call you. I'm gonna call on you in a minute. So here we go. So, so what unites us? And here are some of the things I want to highlight. And this is what we are united by salvation through Jesus Christ. If you can read Galatians uh, chapter three, verses twenty six and twenty nine. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This, you know, our salvation, number one, off the top, unites us. We're all sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. If there's any question you need to ask people, is, what do you think about Jesus? You know, have you been, have you been baptized yet? We got a, a friend of ours, a, a sister of ours, uh, came to the church Sunday and um, uh, expressed to me she wants to get baptized. So we're excited. So, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna baptize her. We'll probably find something 
hopefully coming up this month, maybe the end of the month, we can baptize her. Um, she's saved. The Lord spoke to her and told her he wants to get baptized uh, again. And so, but that's what we have in court. We're being baptized, the old person, what raising up to newness of life, right? And I love this. Again, we talked about uh, ethnicity, Jew or Greek. He said, there's neither. Slave or free, there's neither. What, male or female, there's neither. Come on. If you want to understand the unity, come on. If you want the practical application of the unity, uh, he says, you're all Abraham's seed, uh, seeds. In other words, people of faith and heirs to the promises of God to, that are for all of us. I don't, my promises, oh, hallelujah, are no different than yours. Oh, hallelujah. You have not because you asked out or maybe you don't believe. I don't know. But the thing is, is that guess what? We're all one. We're all in the same boat. And I love this. And you need to start seeing each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need titles because we need to define who we are. You need pastors, people, all, you know, all these titles. No, you need those titles because those titles tell the authority that one has. It tells their position and purpose that they have. And it's necessary. But, but at the end of the day, even with the title, we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. And that, that needs to mean something to you. Amen. We're united by the Holy Spirit. Regina, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. The same spirit, the Holy Spirit. When you receive Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit came to live in your body as the temple of God. That is also considered as a baptism into the body of Christ. You became a part of the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. We are united because we are a part of the kingdom of God. Doesn't matter, black, white, come on, rich, poor, come on, Chinese. It doesn't matter if the Holy Spirit lives in you. Come on, then you what? They're a part of the kingdom of God. and I am, and you are, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's when Jesus said, Verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. If you come on, if the Spirit of God is not living in you, you are not born again. If, that, if you have a question, you're probably not born again because you don't, you, it's not a feeling. Come on, there's a presence of God in your life that you just cannot deny. It is undeniable. You don't have to jump around, roll around, jump, leap speak in tongues, but you know the Holy Spirit lives in you. If it's not, then you might want to consider um, finding out why. Okay, we're united by doctrine. 1 Corinthians 1 and 10, 1 Corinthians 12, 15. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Let me say something real quick. I love this because Paul had the, the hardest time with the Corinthian church. When you read the letter, which first Corinthians and second Corinthians, what a mess. These were people that were filled with the spirit operating in the gifts but also operating and walking in carnality. They were immature, babes in Christ. They were selfish. They were, their minds had not been renewed. Um, they were people with wealth and used to being treated a certain way. And when the church came together in Corinthians, it was a mess because you had all these so-called leaders that have come with money and wealth and influence coming together into church and continue to operate in that carnality. And so Paul just had the hardest time, come on, dealing with them because they all had opinions. And so he, this letter is for every church. If you want to know the problems you're going to have in church, um, this is it. <laughs> you want to read it. And I love it. And what does he ask them to do? He, he pleads with them to do what? To speak the same thing. He even says, look, let there be no division among you, but be perfectly joined together. How? In the same mind and judgment. 
How are we going to have the same mind and judgment? We've got to have the same doctrine. We have to read the scriptures. That's why it's so important that we do what? We study the Bible. That's why it's so important. We study the Bible so we can know, learn what it says. Okay, let's go on. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except uh, Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. As just goes to show you them what he was dealing with. Uh, they were arguing. <laughs> um, they were staking their case. It was division in the church, and um, and they had their opinions. And one, and it was style and preference. I I prefer Paul over apostles or Cephas, you know, and one, I, to me, the one that says, I'm a Christ, it, it seems to me they got it right, but is Christ divided? No, he's not. And so what uh, Christ, well, we're supposed to be one and united in Christ. And when we are divided, trust me, there's flesh involved. Okay, First Corinthians 1, 18, 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. And both of them were wrong. One wanted God to do something and rule, and the other wanted to what, be smart and know the answers of the universe. I love that. And it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. And, and that's, that's the tool that God uses. Some people say, well, I like teaching only. Well, the truth is, is God uses preaching and teaching. He doesn't use one. The truth is, if somebody declares something to you and you believe, guess what? That becomes the power of God. Being used. Okay, verse 23, 25. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen. So we are united. I said that to say we are united by our faith. And Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You know, one of the one of the interesting things about church today is church is trying to find a, a different spend. Um, I even heard this phrase, you know, they don't have our DNA. You know, that's not scriptural. That's setting yourself aside, saying that we do it better. We have something nobody else has. That's not glorifying God. That's setting yourself up for a fall. Um, even though God can, God can bless something and people not fit whatever God blesses in their church. Doesn't mean that God's not blessing them because there's what? There's one spirit. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Come on. Um, sometimes we focus on so many things that are different because we want to be different. 
and we don't focus on the main thing. I love Paul. Paul says, the one thing I do, leaving those things that are behind and stretching toward the mark of the high call that's in Christ Jesus. Um, I can honestly say that, that that mark is to become one with God, one with each other. That mark is the salvation of, through Jesus Christ, and the healing and deliverance that takes place in our life. That, that mark is being transformed into the very image of Christ, becoming like Jesus from glory to glory. Uh, that mark is you becoming a light and a salt in the earth. In other words, people, when they see you, they see Jesus. Because you're planting seeds to whatever God calls you to, however God calls you to do it, whether it's singing or write, writing a book, whether it's children's ministry, whatever God calls you to, a father, a mother, whatever God calls you to be, you're that light, the Christ that on some people, the, what, the, you're the only Christ they're going to see. And finally, what that mark is to know and understand that our goal, finally, at the end of the day, is that we would go to be with Jesus. Remember, he said, Father, I pray that they will be one with us. What do you think? I mean, you're going to be mad because you get to be with the Lord? Maybe you're not in love yet. Maybe you still need to work on the first commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then your neighbor is just like, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe if you're not feeling that, maybe that's, maybe that's the issue. Maybe there's no love there yet. But I love it because you say, you love me because I first loved you. Maybe, maybe God can show you some more love so you turn around and start loving him. But I tell you, if it gets bad out there, <laughs> uh, trust me, your love will turn. <laughs> if it gets real bad, because he's the only one that can rescue you. You know, um, it's, it's a harsh reality to accept as a father, a husband, that um, you can't be it all to them. Only God can. Okay, let's go on. Um, I just want a couple more minutes of your time. But this is so powerful. God himself is the example of unity. So much so that he transforms himself or he... He allows himself to be three people and one person, the Trinity. I just wanted to show you, and it goes on and on and on and on. Uh, God expresses himself as three individuals, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, united together in one person, God. You know, I always used to wonder, man, why the Trinity? I mean, God, this message is so deep. God, this message of, of being united with God, Christ, God says, you know what? I, I, I'm going to be one person. I'm going to show you that 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 you, you, unity is so powerful that you can only see one person, even though I'm three different people. Oh, man, that, that'll twist. That's a mind twister. <laughs> Amen. That, that doesn't, that does, that's impossible, some people would say. But what God... <laughs> But, but with God, all things are possible. And God says, I'm three people, but, but I'm so united, I'm one. First John 5 and 7 says it like this. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, who's the Word? Jesus is the Word. So how can I be one with God? Through his word. How can I be one with God? Through the Holy Spirit. And what's the goal? The goal is to what? To love God. With all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. To be one. And then to do what? And then to love my brother and my sister as of myself. Now I'm operating in the unity. And I'm operating in, in, in the unity of God. We'll, we'll, we, we'll uh, revisit this because our time's up. But let me just say this a couple of things. We're united in creation. We'll talk about that later because it gets deep. Um, we're united as the trinity or the triune of man, body, soul, and spirit. There's a spirit of a united in marriage. 
we're united in, in the family, we're united in humanity. This thing goes on and on and on. God is not an island. God really wants you to understand that he has not called you to be an island. He's called you to be a uh, community, social. Doesn't mean that you don't need time to yourself. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you are a part of something greater than yourself. And, and man, praise God, you are part of the kingdom of God. Amen. So with that, let me just say a prayer, and then um, I'll open it up. And I hope you got something out of this. Kind of went over it again, restructured it a little bit. But I was trying to get to this area last week, but we'll go over this uh, following uh, Wednesday. Just these, these other areas that God unites us in and how he continues to show us that he's a God of community. He's a God of more than just one moving part and how he wants us to be uh, a part of this, this thing that he calls life. So Father, in the blessed name of Jesus, once again, we come to you and we thank you. We, we bless you, we praise you. Thank you for being a part of our lives and showing us yourself. Thank you for revelation knowledge. Um, as I was praying earlier, oh God, I just pray that, uh, that we receive that revelation in our hearts, our minds, and our souls, and that we become even better at um, becoming a one people. There's power and being united. In Jesus' name we pray. Let more say it. Amen. Okay, let me stop sharing.